Good morning, everyone. My name is Carlos Jose Munoz. I'm the current COO of Ateos, as well as a graduate student at UC San Diego. At Ateos, we envision a new generation of wearable technology. We want to bring wearables to the brink of invisibility. I'd like to begin this presentation by paying respects to the 1969 Apollo mission that saw astronauts touch down on the moon for the very first time. Astronauts wore spacesuits such as these that were large and bulky, had low resolution displays, and a plethora of gizmos and gadgets that track physiological characteristics. Since that mission, technology has advanced. Spacesuits have become more sleek, more conformal. Displays, flexible with higher resolution, as well as wearable devices to track physiological characteristics are becoming more sleek, conformal, being able to hide. Now, for technology to advance past this, we need to change one thing, batteries. The bulky, rigid battery that currently is the standard for the market is rigid. Now, if we want to go ahead and change the designer's thought where they're designing the product around the battery, we need to sub out a battery that can actually be designable, which is why at Atales we believe you should design the battery around the product. And from that, we engineered the first printable, stretchable, and flexible battery. If you guys can please pay attention to the square, no matter how I bend, stretch, or flex, the LED's intensity stays the same. Now, this battery is actually printed in the word nano. That's printed on top of a TPU film that's ironed onto a piece of elastic to show ease of processing. The way this technology works is through Tails' elastic polymer with any conductive filler and solvents, a conductive ink will then be generated. From that, you can leverage off of screen printing, roll to roll printing, or 3D printing, as well as a ton of use cases for this technology. Currently, this technology is patent pending with 71 claims, and a US track one has been filed, so we'll be able to hear a response by this November. Now, the core IP is a 20 claims in formulation, and we decided to have a picket fence strategy around this IP, protected by the 13 claims in manufacturing, as well as the 38 claims in use cases. This technology was actually came up by uh, our founder and CEO, Rajan Kumar, through an ARPA-E grant for the project called Attach for a thermoelectric shirt a shirt that will heat you up on a cool day and cool you off on a hot day. Now, when designing the shirt and the battery, something came to mind. We can't use a bulky, rigid ba battery technology that we have currently. And for that, some things came to mind. What chemistry do we use? Things like that. And from there, he found uh, inspiration from the lunar module, the zinc silver oxide battery that was actually used. And that sparked the idea of a zinc-based battery to be able to be safe, be economical, as well as do the job, especially it's going to be on the skin. Having a lithium-based battery can be troublesome. And what we also found is that this same zinc-silver battery is found in healthcare devices such as hearing aids. Now, what you're looking at here is our first prototype. It's a zinc battery that's flexible and stretchable. The leading energy and power density from all thin film batteries. It's rechargeable currently up to 30 cycles as well as safe, recyclable, and abundant, as zinc is. It's low cost and scalable as well. How do we stack up against the competition? As I mentioned before, the aerial capacity beats the competition. At 2.5 milliamp hours per centimeter squared, we are the leading aerial capacity. We are the only stretchable battery, one of the few truly flexible batteries. We are also printable. And as I mentioned before, rechargeable up to 30 cycles. In the market, we're looking at a plethora of ideas in the wide world of wearables, rather than fashion, communications, medical, business operations. Now, what I've learned through this startup is that a startup doesn't die of starvation. They die of indigestion, which is why this $75 billion market, after talking to industry professionals and Understanding the pain points across different verticals, we've narrowed it down to medical wearables, a $20 billion market. But where we solve the major pain point and the quickest pain point for our technology feasibility is in transdermal or epidermal patches, a $2.2 billion market. Now, the way we go to market is initially we're signing a JDA or joint developmental agreement with our partners to be able to develop this technology further for the specific requirements for the transdermal patch market. From there, we'll sign with a small firm, such as a scenario or chronotherapeutics, to be able to start getting a reputation, a sales reputation, to deliver a quality battery on time. And finally, hit market penetration with a mega firm, such as a Dexcom. 
From this, we will go ahead and use this model to generate revenues from the small firms up to the mega firms, where the retailer, let's take the example of Dexcom, will sign a developmental contract for it tells to perform the uh, battery integration into their patches. That integration will then be sent over to an OEM to scale the, uh, the patches for us, giving us three sources of revenue. A developmental contract initially, a production contract, as well as royalty agreements offer these production contracts. With this model, we expect healthy economic standing with 51.9 million by 2025. And this model here is modeled after three specific companies, as I mentioned, Sonera, Chronotherapeutics, and Dexcom. Now, for this to work, we need a strong team. Currently, Rajan Kumar, our CEO, founder, and inventor of the technology, is a fourth-year PhD student at UC San Diego. Jennifer Miller, our CTO, she's a third-year Bachelor's of Science in Nanoengineering. Myself, I'm a second-year Biomedical Engineer at UC San Diego. And Kartik Sharma, a Master's in Finance. Today, actually, he is graduating, so we are extremely proud of him as well as our scientific advisory board. We're coached by some of the top scientists, uh, Dr. Joseph Wang, a leader in wearables as well as nanoengineering, Dr. Shirley Mang, a battery expert, she's well renowned in her field, and Dr. Sanjay Gupta. He understands how to bring a lab product into the market, as well as our business advisory board that consists of four individuals who's helped us refine our pitch, generate funding, and really know how to leverage off of different individuals and be well connected in the realm of business. And finally, our legal team. Our legal team making sure that we are sound legally, we have all the right documents in place, and really helping us with our IP strategy as well. What have we done thus far? We raised 200,000 worth of non-diluted funds through grants and pitch competitions. We've also talked to over 100 plus industry professionals from different verticals, specifically in the medical wearable industry, and continuous battery development. What we plan to do is go ahead and partner with the folks at NASA, as well as some other individuals such as Tioga Research, to get down that first wearable market product. We are currently seeking 1.25 million in seed funding to be able to acquire assets and other business operational needs. We hope to display our development at CES or Printed Electronics Trade Show coming in 2019. So in summary, the market we'll be attacking is the medical wearable space, specifically in transdermal patches. The problem we're solving are bulky, rigid batteries. Through our solution is a stretchable, conformal battery. With our business model, our three-stage business model. Thank you, everyone, for your time and attention. I will now accept questions. So you're, you said you could do 30 cycles. Uh, is that adequate for the applications you want? And what is the biggest challenge in extending the number of cycles? So the biggest, so I'll answer that with the latter. The biggest challenge to extend the cycleability is really the electrolyte. Uh, currently, we're focusing on getting to a solid state electrolyte, although that's the holy grail. Uh, fixing that should be, shouldn't be too major of an issue with our partners. And as a secondary battery, 30 cycles is low, but as a primary battery, that should be fine for the use of medical wearables. Uh, these transdermal patches are throwaway patches, so we intend to be a primary battery. What is the, uh, the life of the primary battery in your, in your nominal application? So right now, we are estimating, so we haven't got to the stage of having a true definition of battery life, but through our calculations, we are expecting the battery life to be around that of an Apple Watch. If you're first targeting medical devices, have you looked at uh, material safety and durability and things like that? Yeah, which is why we decided to go down the zinc route. So zinc-based batteries are much safer. Uh, as I mentioned, Dexcom. Uh, Dexcom's battery that they currently use is a zinc silver oxide battery. And so what we're imagining, it would just kind of be uh, an integration challenge than anything else. Zinc's much safer than lithium. Do you foresee the opportunity to print these in space possibly someday? And what would be the biggest challenge for that? Yeah, so actually we, uh, 
gave a similar presentation over at the Rice Business Plan competition where we were recognized by NASA as the most innovative idea. And from that, we had a conversation with some folks at NASA regarding to print this uh, for energy distribution across a spacesuit uh, to be able to send it to space. And so that's how we see it, imagining into space. Uh, the biggest challenge with that would be stress testing the battery, making sure that, it's temperature, that it reaches the temperature sensitive. Uh, a lot of these applications, they're looking for negative, I think it was negative 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, so that can be an issue in terms of complexity. How does the specific energy compare to, well, lithium primary batteries, for example? Uh, that, I'm not sure. When do you anticipate having the battery to be able to, to test it with the space requirements? When do you think it would be available? For that, uh, it would probably determine on the funding as well as uh, kind of the bandwidth of the team. Right now, we're really focused on uh, knocking down this one centimeter by one centimeter battery for medical wearables. Um, so I would imagine that might be a little ways away. Can you clarify a little ways away? Two years, five years, 10 years? I imagine year. probably up to five years. Thank you. So you're trying to raise 1.25 million uh, seed funding. So what specifically will you use this uh, funds for and how long will this last? So right now we are primarily using the funds to be able to uh, acquire more assets such as patents. Uh, we are currently filing uh, different patents as we're getting interest from the Asian markets as well as the European regions. So we want to go ahead and file in those areas as well as acquire more equipment. Uh, currently we have our own facilities at UC San Diego uh, where we're printing 10 batteries a day but with another screen printer we would be able to expand our operations and uh, de-risk scalability uh, much quicker. Uh, so we probably estimate 1.25 million probably lasting us a uh, year and a half. And at the end of year and a half what will you have demonstrated that you don't have now? So with that we are hoping to be able to demonstrate a full commercial ready prototype for medical wearable space in terms of being able to uh, mount this on a patch itself and really show an integrative solution as well as with Bluetooth capability. As uh, you folks might know, Zinc is actually more capable for Bluetooth as it is pulse current. So we want to go ahead and demonstrate all these as we've talked to uh, the folks at Dexcom and they're, they're excited about this technology, but it comes with uh, risks as well. So what did they define as those risks? Uh, so right now, that's why we had the three-step process. Uh, they, they like the technology, however, there is the situation of reputation as well. So that's why we're hoping to build up to that. It's more of a play of, um, doesn't sound that we need to prove the technology feasibility, but it's more of a reputation in that sense to be able to get the deal with Dexcom, in my opinion. How what? recyclable or regenerative is, is this material? If you're going to be using it, using it in space, we try to recycle and reuse a lot. I'm not sure. With regard to the medical applications, what, are the, what is the qualification process there? And in the devices that you're thinking about, what is the uh, criticality of those devices? So you mentioned diabetic patches. Well, if, that, if the battery runs out on a, on a diabetes monitoring patch, I imagine there are more than reputational consequences, right? Yeah. So I guess to answer your question, the risks that are involved with the battery on a transdermal patch are the same that the risks are involved with the coin cell. Uh, so I read recently that the, uh, what was it, Metronix, uh, one of their patches was actually recalled because there was a disconnect between the controller that was administering a drug and the battery itself. Um, but in that sense, same, same risks apply uh, to any traditional battery that a transdermal patch currently has. How does your battery work in a high humidity environment? Does it, does it still perform? High humidity environment? We're still under stress testing, so I can't answer that question. Okay. How, how would the size and weight of your battery compare to the coin cell you're trying to displace? It's much lighter. Uh, right now we are printing at 0.5 millimeters and I think about a density of, what's the number? It escapes me, sorry. Uh, what will it take for your um, um, to be able to do wireless charging of your battery? 
So wireless charging, we are currently, so Dr. Sanjay Gupta is uh, the chairman of uh, Air Fuel Alliance with his uh, wireless charging firm. And so he's gonna be helping us uh, de-risk wireless charging and, uh, and progressing that route. What, what will he do? So he's gonna help us uh, generate the circuit. Essentially it's much, it's off the shelf equipment that will be able to make the circuit possible with our battery. So it's more of a battery integration with the circuit board. So will that also be flexible? Yes. In the sense where these mar off the market shelves, they're small chips. And so really the rigidity comes when you're covering more surface area. So yes, I imagine that would still be flexible. You talked a little bit about ease of manufacturing. Can you describe that a little more fully and how that you see that scaling up and what, how that compares to the state of the art? Like, will you have to totally retool all the manufacturing facilities or how, how does that work? No, so we've actually thought about that in terms of we don't want to go in and uh, redo these big manufacturing facilities where, you know, you turn it off and it, it costs, a, you know, a ton of money to go ahead and turn those things back on. So what we're imagining is being able to be at the end of a solution, kind of like the last uh, the last thing that you add into the manufacturing uh, facilities through rotor world printing. So the ease of manufacturing question can be answered by the fact that through rotor world printing would be able to print it after after the fact essentially. So you mentioned the thickness is 0.5 millimeters and I'm curious if you're planning on going um, higher or lower and if there's a trade-off then in flexibility or in pa uh, pad battery power efficiency. So yeah, if you go much higher, you can imagine past 0.5 millimeters, you're starting to add more thickness to it, which can uh, make things less flexible as you add more layers. Uh, but right now we're sticking to that 0.5 millimeters to be able to distribute around instead of up, but we can print up. And if you, and if you print up, do you get more battery power efficiency or is, it, is there a correlation? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. Does anyone in the back have a question? One question. You said that you're going to be incorporating this into wearables. Obviously, how does that hold up when you're washing the wearables? What, what does that do? So that's essentially why we haven't gone into the e-textile market, but what I could answer that with is the way you seal the battery. The battery itself, the conductive ink, is not necessarily waterproof, but how you seal it can be. So the TPU film that we initially printed on can be waterproof. So you'd print onto that TPU film, and then you'd seal it again with another TPU film, and you could essentially go ahead and iron that onto the shirt, and you would theoretically have a washable shirt. You gave some comparisons to uh, other vendors. Uh, they're not stretchable. What type of batteries were they? Were they l larger, the same size, same? So for those, the batteries, so the biggest competitor that we have is on that zinc column as well, uh, Imprint Energy. Uh, they use kind of a flexible battery as well. Uh, so they're all essentially in the thin film battery market. OK, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, Judges, if you would take a few minutes to score Atios. Uh, and for those of you online, we're going to take a break at 10.30 and we'll resume at 10.45.